The so-called budget emergency, which underpins this measure, is the government's key justification for its cruel and unnecessary cuts to our country's most disadvantaged. And we've had a number of people, um, my colleague, Senator Wish Wilson, highlighted what a bunk the budget, so-called budget emergency is. The same way that we now have a confected, we have a confected budget emergency and a budget crisis, we also have a confected welfare crisis, which is used to justify these cruel measures. I think we should note that while this measure, of course, if it was properly implemented and people weren't using the loopholes, which I'll come to in a minute, would get three billion or potentially make three billion, this budget takes twelve billion off the most vulnerable members of our community. And this levy is simply to hide the fact that this government is driving an ideological agenda to take that money off Australia's most vulnerable and fundamentally change our community. Because that's what this budget is about. That's what these measures do. And you make a little token with a whole lot of little loopholes built in to make it look as if you're also hitting your mates when you're not. You're hitting the most vulnerable. Mr Hockey's claim of the end of age of entitlement was all about driving his ideological change to cut income support, social security, to cut things like universal health care. That's what this is about. Let's make no mistake, and you're not fooling Australians, let me tell you, because they hate it. They hate it. They know what you're up to. This emergency has been debunked by both the International Monetary Fund and again this week by the Independent Parliamentary Budget Office. This confected budget emergency is further entrenching inequality in this country. And if that's what the aim was, which it seems like it is, that's what you're doing. Allowing inequality to continue to grow will put significant pressure on our community and, in fact, fundamentally changes our community. We know that inequality in itself has negative health impacts. If the government implements its agenda, which hits single parents, which hits pensioners, carers, we know they're going after carers, some more. Um, hit those with disabilities, hits our young people, our next generations. All groups we already know are living in poverty. We already know they're suffering the effects of that poverty. We know what impact poverty has in entrenching disadvantage in intergen intergenerational consequences. We already know that our current income support system is inadequate. Try living on Newstart. I have for only a week, and you can't do it. We know people on Newstart are living in poverty. We know single parents are living in poverty. We know that 30 per cent of people over uh, the age of 65 are already living in poverty. This budget comes with a big price, and that price is driving the most vulnerable members of our community into poverty. That price is increasing inequality. It is because of the inherent inequality of this budget and the apparent acceptance by this government that, in a, that growing inequality in general is OK that we want to see these budget measures defeated. We don't want to see a levy in place. We actually want to see progressive tax reform. We believe that this levy needs to be a permanent tax change. We have never hidden that fact. We have never hidden the fact that we think we need tax reform. But this levy, as I said, is simply designed to make it look as if the big mates, the big end of town, are paying a little bit when we know that it's actually the most vulnerable, the most vulnerable in our community that are going to be paying the price, not just in the fact uh, that they'll be living in poverty, but in terms of the long-term consequences. Cuts to payments and programs for those on low income, $12 billion, are permanent changes. They are permanent changes to those 
payments and to those community members and to our community. And that's what the agenda is here. It is not the confected budget crisis. It is not the confected welfare crisis. It is the fact that this government wants to change our society. This temporary uh, deficit levy will raise, as I said, three billion if you don't manage to find a loophole. And uh, Senator Wong articulated some of those loopholes, as did my colleague Senator Wish Wilson. Of course, the race will be on to find those loopholes. So we'll never see the three billion dollars from this levy. Avoiding the real conversation and relying on the trickle-down economics is clearly what this government is at, and they clearly want to create a sort of society in Australia that's mean and cruel, which is what these cuts are. These are particularly um, cruel to the most vulnerable members of our community. And when you look at the fact that this government has not gone for revenue measures which would genuinely raise significant amounts of money for our uh, budget. They have, if you look at the evidence, the new evidence that internationally there's more than $21 trillion of assets hidden offshore due to tax loopholes. If the Australian component of this was taxed properly, this would certainly generate um, more income for Australia and would, and would also change the conversation about our national wealth. Instead, we have a community where the gap in Australia between those that have the assets and the money and those that don't is growing. The wealthiest 1 per cent of Australians have more than 60 per cent of the country's wealth. And the way these changes will impact on the most vulnerable means that they'll keep it and it'll grow. The nine richest people in Australia have a fortune that equates to the bottom 20 per cent of our country. That's 4.5 million people. There's been a concerted effort to make out that, the in that income support is putting enormous pressure on our budget. But the Hilda report today, bad timing I know for the government, shows that in fact there has been a gradual decline in welfare reliance on all working age people over the last two decades. In 2001, 23 per cent of people aged 16 to, to 64 have, re, have received, uh, received welfare payments each week. In 2011, that had fallen to 18.5 per cent. The proportion of households receiving, receiving any welfare fell from 41.3 per cent to 34.7 per cent. The Hilda survey reports today have put paid to Treasurer Joe Hockey's claims that there is a welfare mentality in Australia and that the government needs to cut the social security budget. But also let me remember here, remind um, this chamber, when the, when the Treasurer says the welfare is costing each Australian $6,000, let's have a think about what that's for. That's to support seniors. It's for the age pension. It's to support people in aged care and the support that needs to go with aged care. It supports pays family tax benefit. It helps the, most dis the people with disability. Not only does it pay the DSP and other uh, disability supports, it also funds the NDIS. It also funds and helps support those people that can't find work for unemployment payments. It pays sick payments. It pays veterans. It pays carers. Well, of course, the government's going for them too. Um, it supports other programs that, provi that provide help to people with disabilities. It, provo it provides childcare, payment income support, child support. People with dis uh, it helps um, pay states uh, for people with disabilities. In other words, it provides those fundamental supports that a caring, generous society provides to its citizens and which underpins our social security system when it came into being at the beginning of the last century. And certainly the feedback I'm getting from the community is community members still want those supports and still believe we should be providing those supports to members of our community. And then let's look at the Oxfam report today, which was also released today, where we learned that 64 per cent of those surveyed said inequality was making Australia a worse place to live. The government seems to be in denial about what inequality looks like. 
Not only are they making the situation worse for many members in our community, the members of the community who bear the, of the, uh, the brunt of these budget cuts, they also have the gall to suggest that under this government Australians have equality of opportunity. They obviously don't understand what equality of opportunity means. You entrench disadvantage and poverty, it makes people in, uh, it increases inequality. They clearly need to go back and have an understanding of what equality of opportunity means. Equality of opportunity means access to education, yet funding for Gonski has been dropped and tertiary education will become much more expensive, particularly for women. Access to housing, yet we've seen funding for social housing cut. Access to work, where this government is putting in place policies that make it harder for people to find work. The perverse incentives that are being built into these measures for young people will entrench poverty and will make it harder for people to find work. Access to health care, and yet this government is fundamentally undermining universal health care at a time when we are not improving, for example, the, um, closing the gap adequately for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country. This debt crisis is a confected crisis. And the debt crisis levy is a poorly constructed ideological budget initiative that simply highlights that the government is being dishonest with the Australian community. There is no budget crisis. There is no welfare crisis. What there is is ideologically driven attacks on the Australian community, confected to try and justify the horrendous cuts that the most vulnerable in our community face, dropping young people into poverty for six months. Of course, if you're born with a silver spoon in your mouth, you never know what it's like to be unemployed and have no income for six months. Maybe you think you can go home to mum and dad. Well, for a start, in estimates, they weren't able to, none of the committees that I asked, and I asked in a number of estimates committees, how many of the young people they expect to be caught up in this measure are living at home. Can't tell you, Senator. How many have children? Can't tell you, Senator. Will a couple, if they're both unemployed and have children, be subject to this measure? Yes, one of them will. So we'll have a family living on one New Start allowance. And we heard in the media over the weekend, and we didn't um, hear this in estimates, that if you're pregnant, you'll be subjected to this measure as well. But you're still, the cute thing I like about that measure is you're still on, in, you're still on New Start. New Start, new payment. It is an abomination. A, to treat the income support system in this manner. The Greens support sensible measures to raise revenue and manage budgets, targeting those who can afford to pay. This includes keeping the current tax on mining super profits a price on carbon pollution. We proposed a new deposit uh, guarantee levy on the big banks' profits and the removal of billions of dollars in corporate welfare, such as the mining diesel subsidies, and none of these were considered in the budget. You could say there is a welfare crisis in this country. The welfare crisis is the fact that this government refuses to look at where you can get real revenue and remove the welfare for big business, which is what the government's doing by refusing to consider measures such as removing the mining diesel subsidies, which provide billions of dollars to the big end of town. We need to assess why we are prepared to abandon a caring society and let this idea of a budget emergency stand when it, is only, when it will only further entrench inequality and make things worse, much worse for many people in our community. How can this government continue to say there is a budget emergency when clearly there isn't and yet 
still trying, tries to take $12 billion off the most vulnerable in our community. Inequality has a significant impact on, uh, impact on people's sense of belonging and feeling excluded. It has real impacts on people's health. Poverty has long-lasting psychological impacts, as well as the most obvious impacts of not being able to eat, not being able to pay for housing, not being able to get clothes, not being able to afford your kids' school books. Anglicare released a report last year that showed the impact of not having enough money, of not having enough money to be able to buy food and what that means for our most vulnerable families. It talked about the shame that children experience when they go to school with no lunch and not being able to take their friends home from school. It talks about the lifelong disadvantage that are experienced um, by uh, people entrenched in poverty and how um, those early experiences bring, um, make people feel shame, long-lasting. Housing stress is, is reaching a critical um, peak, particularly in my home state of Western Australia. We have families living in one room, or worse, in tents and in their cars. Families with young children living in cars. How can you go to work, go to school and expect a bit to perform in job interviews when you haven't got a home and you haven't been able to eat, when you're stressed because you can't feed your family? The Salvation Army's Economic and Social Impact Survey has also highlighted the serious challenges facing many people across Australia, including homelessness and housing insecurity, a lack of food and heating, no access to money in emergencies and social isolation. The report also highlighted the serious consequences of the GP co-payment and the challenges to the PBS, with a quarter of people surveyed already unable to afford afford medical treatment and 34 per cent of people going without medication. Poor health, insecure housing, going without meals and being unable to at least heat a room in the house during winter are events and situations that trap people in long-term disadvantage and they're real, they're live, they're happening now. It's time to stop pretending that this is a level playing field and that people, anybody, has the same access to opportunity when clearly they don't, and this budget makes it worse. We need to start talking seriously about how we resource the kind of community we want to live in, a kind of community that provides those um, uh, purposes that I outlined that our social security um, pays for, something that the Joe Hockey, sorry, the Treasurer um, Ho uh, Joe Hockey, seems to think the Australian community don't care about. Well, I can tell you they do care about it. They do care that we have a caring society, and this government has lost, lost touch with that society. We don't want a temporary debt levy for it to relieve a fake budget emergency. We want a proper tax reform not something that the government, just by coincidence, the, the levy, the temporary levy need for it will end, let me guess, by the end of 2015, beginning of 2016, when the next election comes around. That's why we have a temporary levy to make it look as if something's happening. It's not, it's not going to collect the revenue that they claim it is because there's loopholes built into it. It takes 12, the, the actual budget measures take $12 billion off the most vulnerable. And then this levy will disappear, but those changes will still be there. Those people that this budget affects will still be living in poverty. This builds in inequality into our future economy. And if that's what the government is planning to do, they've done it. The disparity between the very wealthy and the very poor is already a cause of economic and social problems. This will get worse. Already in 2014, the Davros Conference, the United States President Barack Obama and Christine Lagarde, Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, have identified inequality as a major risk to the pace and stability of future social and economic growth. And that's what will happen in Australia as well. If this budget proceeds like the government planned, 
It will increase inequality. The Greens will not support that. We will not support those measures. We want permanent reform to our tax system, not a temporary levy that you conveniently take off before the next election and look like you've delivered something.